Uh, with, <laughs> without any more interruptions, this is Jimmy. Jimmy Zielinski. I'm happy to have it here. Hey. Uh, mic working? Everyone sound good? Cool. All right. Uh, welcome to the first session. Ralph, I'm going to ask you to get out of the way, just so I can see my, my notes, so I can cheat a little bit. Um, welcome to the first session. Uh, I'm Jimmy Zielinski. Um, actually, let me stay on the slide. You can find my socials here, mostly Twitter and GitHub. Um, basically, um, before checking out my socials, obviously, you need a reason to know uh, why I'm cool, why you should follow me. Um, so full disclosure, I am a co-founder of a company called AuthZ. And what AuthZ does is it builds a database called SpiceDB. SpiceDB is an open source permissions database. So it's a database that stores data, and you use it to query and effectively ask questions around access control in software. Um, so with that, I am going to be a slight bit biased in this talk, obviously, as I work at an authorization vendor. However, my goal for this conversation and this talk um, is not to pitch my product. It's to inform people about the space because um, I found that there's a lot of confusion in this space. And generally, if folks can navigate the waters of this ecosystem, they're more likely to find um, themselves in scenarios where my product, for example, is a good fit. Um, and they're going to find plenty of other great products that are also good fits, um, but making sure that you can find the right product is a prerequisite for all of us having success in this space. Um, so before all the authorization stuff, I actually uh, have been involved in the container ecosystem for a super long time. Um, I'm actually a maintainer of OCI, which is the container specification. Um, and that started with my work as the first employee at Quay, which uh, is the first private Docker registry. Um, it was acquired by CoreOS, and then CoreOS was acquired by Red Hat, and then Red Hat was acquired by IBM. And <laughs> yeah, so there, I've gone through a, a Matryoshka doll of many different cloud native companies. Um, in that time, I have been in both um, engineering and product roles. So I've kind of been on both sides of the, uh, of the ecosystem in terms of kind of like working with customers, but also building out the technologies that are transforming the industry. Um, I've created a couple different uh, and co-authored co -authored and contributed to a couple different projects in the cloud native ecosystem. Um, more importantly, kind of like Claire, which is an open source container vulnerability scanner. I'm going to talk about a little bit further on. Um, I am one of the original co-authors of the operator framework. Um, and then uh, App Registry, which is kind of the inspiration for people using OCI to upload completely different artifacts other than containers to container registries. Um, and with that, I'm going to move on to the problem. The problem is there are just too many different projects in the authorization space. Um, I basically just went to landscape.cncf.io. I went to the security section, and I just started to throw up some random ones up here. Um, all of these things have authorization implications. Even if it's not really obvious at first, there are some general purpose solutions up here. Uh, you can see like open policy agent. That might be obvious that it's kind of an authorization tool. Um, but a lot of these other uh, projects actually have um, more special use case. They're kind of targeting one particular thing and not general purpose authorization. Um, and that makes them a really, really uh, good tool for the job if that's the exact problem you're trying to solve. But um, you, you're going to completely eliminate them, not even think about them uh, if you're not trying to solve that exact problem. Um, and to make this a little bit more concrete, I'm going to talk about Claire. Uh, and talk about why something like a vulnerability scanner I just mentioned has anything to do with authorization. Um, so scanning containers for vulnerabilities, uh, what's the whole point to doing that? Well, typically folks want to know if their software is secure or not before it goes into a production environment. And right there, that latter part, before it goes into a production environment, means there's a question. The question is, can this thing be deployed? Am I allowed to deploy this thing? If there are vulnerabilities in it, no. If there are not vulnerabilities, yes. That fundamentally is a permissions question. Um, you are asking whether this thing has access to be deployed. Um, so even projects that you may not assume have anything to do with authorization often very much so do. Um, all right. So. We've seen the problem. The ecosystem's massive. I'm not going to be able to enumerate every single one of those projects we just saw. 
so what can we do? Well, um, today what I hope to do is establish kind of a methodology for uh, analyzing each project. I'm going to um, basically ask you uh, to suspend any previous interpretations of some of the vocabulary I'm going to use. Um, a lot of it comes from ecosystems uh, or a lot of it comes from a perspective of analyzing things in a particular way, and I'm going to analyze everything from the perspective of authorization. So that means uh, I might use a word that you're familiar with, that you understand, you know deeply, but I'm going to be using it in a different context to kind of display a dichotomy um, that exists purely for forms of um, trying to understand these authorization projects. So. Um, once you've kind of suspended your pre-existing bias in the space, um, I'm going to reintroduce or introduce some of these concepts. And then uh, for each concept, we're going to iterate through them and um, kind of talk about what implications that has on your decision-making process for selecting a project or deploying or using such a solution. And then um, I'm going to show you some examples in the cloud native ecosystem that display uh, each of those concepts. All right, so no authorization talk is complete without starting from the very, very beginning and covering the complete basics, which is what is auth. So authorization is but one half of the term auth. Um, there's actually two terms in this space, and people conflate them a lot. But uh, today, we're going to be focusing on specifically authorization. But on the other side of that is authentication. So the difference between these two, um, I like to use these completely different words because they don't sound at all similar. Identity for authentication and permissions for authorization. Um, authentication, you're probably more familiar with because it's a pretty well-established ecosystem. Um, it has to do with logging into software. It's typically asserting that who you are is who you say you are. So providing evidence to prove that you are the person you claim to be. Um, whereas authorization or permissions is once you have established who you are, it's asking the question of what are you allowed to do? Now that we know who you are, are you, are you where you're supposed to be? Are you doing a thing you're supposed to be? Should, should you be allowed to do that particular thing? Um, it can sometimes get a little bit fuzzy. There are technologies that kind of have a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Um, I'm going to try to avoid any of that confusion. Um, if you have any questions about any technologies that you think kind of like fuzz these lines, you can feel free to talk to me afterwards, and we can kind of uh, go over that uh, if there's any confusion there. Um, so here's some examples of things you might be familiar with. DEX is an identity provider. That's a CNCF project that's been around for a couple of years, started at CoreOS. Um, that basically enables software to be able to log in with the protocol called OIDC. Um, if you're working in corporate environments, you may be, may be familiar with uh, software such as LDAP or Active Directory. And then there's pretty big companies in the space called Ping Federate and Okta. And these are all identity provider um, companies. On the flip side of authorization, I'm going to plug SpiceDB, which is my company's project. Um, it's an open source project, as I described earlier, that does authorization. There's Open Policy Agent, which is a super, super popular um, CNCF project um, that enforces policy on software infrastructure, typically, likely Kubernetes resources. Um, but then this last one is actually super interesting um, because everything mentioned so far has been standalone software, but actually Pundit and Flask Authorize are kind of the Ruby and Python ecosystem, respectively, libraries that you'd use when building a web application uh, to build out the authorization layer of your web application. So not only can these things be standalone, but oftentimes they're actual just libraries um, kind of there for you to be molding into the models that you would like to see in your application. So just to <laughs> refirm, I'm not going to be talking about authentication for the rest of this talk. Everything is going to be on the right-hand side. It's all going to be authorization. And things might get a little bit fuzzy on terminology, but I'm going to ask you to try to keep a um, clean palette as we go through. So authorization, this is the focus for today. I'm going to break it down into three kind of general categories, general questions, the who, where, and the how. Um, I'm going to start with uh, who, which is who is being secured. If you're trying to develop a new system, this is probably the first question you should ask. Who is the audience of this software? 
And so we've got these two different terms. Um, you may have heard of the one on the left. It's called IAM. Um, cloud providers have services that are called IAM. Uh, IAM is Identity and Access Management is what it stands for. It typically is used for securing what your employees can do or internal users can do. If you think about its use case at a cloud provider, um, it's typically used for securing the cloud services, saying this person has access to the service or not. Um, you probably know it from logging into your corporate email, things like that. Um, but I wanted to focus on this specifically in the dichotomy of IAM versus CIAM, which is a term that is not as popular, you may not be familiar with, um, which has to do with customer IAM. So this is uh, cl uh, clarifying that it is specifically for customer-facing systems. So if we use an example of a bank, the bank tellers are logging into the different uh, booths with IAM. Um, that is the provider that is working for them. And then when a, a user is coming up and wants to withdraw money, um, checking to see whether or not they have access to withdraw money or withdraw funds from their bank account is accessing a CIAM system. <coughs> So there are some technical implications that have to do purely just with audience, and it can go uh, pretty, pretty deep here. Um, if you're, first of all, we're going to look at consistency, data consistency. Um, in an IAM system, uh, because you're typically dealing with internal applications, um, things can be eventually consistent. You're probably not churning through employees as fast as users on a social network um, or a SaaS application. Uh, if you are, that's a pretty impressive business. Um, so you might actually not need uh, as fine-grained control over the data consistency. Syncing who works at the company daily could be good enough. Um, you don't have to have a perfect check. Um, everyone is escorted out of the building on their last day, so maybe after working hours on one day, everything is fine. Um, but on a customer system, you're going to be live banning people, um, all kinds of things. People are going to be registering constantly. Um, you kind of have way more flow of users interacting with the system, and you might have a completely different uh, domain that you're trying to solve that requires um, you at least having what I call bounded consistency, which is saying that after a particular event or, or point in time, things need to actually reflect reality. Um, so. Uh, well, I'll talk a little bit more about consistency later, but that's all for consistency for now. Um, the next is kind of like the granularity of checking permissions. Um, in a corporate environment, you can typically kind of bucket people into roles. Are they a part of this department? Are they a part of this team? Um, are they in the C-suite? Um, and that is typically good enough for gating access to particular things. Um, whereas in customer systems, you might need to say, well, um, they should have access to this organization and all of the resources with that organization, but maybe Larry is out on vacation this Friday, so we're going to delegate access to Larry's resources to Bob because Bob is going to be taking over and handling that while Larry's out of the office. And now we're starting to talk about um, like making little bits of exceptions where things don't land clearly into individual buckets, and you might have to have way, way, way more fine granularity. Um, you could be implementing a system like uh, Notion, um, where you have access to individual rows in like an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. You, could, uh, you can really get fine-grained in customer-facing applications in a way that uh, the domain kind of drives that the typical org chart that you're using on an IAM system just won't, won't have. Um, and kind of in a similar vein to all of that, there is kind of the malleability of the uh, structure. So in your typical corporate environment, you probably have some kind of hierarchy that's a tree um, for your, your org tree. Um, where it starts with like the C-suite and kind of like goes down. Um, and unless you acquire folks or you kind of like hire a big team um, or you go through a reorg, you're really, it, it, even in those scenarios, you're not really changing the overall structure of the business that much. But in a customer-facing system, maybe you're a startup, you haven't figured out the problem space yet, you're still kind of like developing what the application and data model should look like, you know potentially that you're going to be refactoring a lot in the future. You don't necessarily know what the end goal will look like, so you know that you're going to make changes to such a system, and you're going to need to make changes in a way that keeps everything secure still. <coughs> 
<clears throat> so uh, all of that, we just extracted all that just from looking at what the audience of uh, the system will be. Um, so we can kind of look at a couple examples in cloud native ecosystem to like pull back and make it more concrete. Um, OAuth 2 proxy is a super popular tool people use to just like slap in front of their web services to put a login box in front of it. Um, and then we have VPN products which do similar like teleport or tail scale. Um, and then there is OPA Gatekeeper or Kiver uh, Kiverno. These are um, software that you install onto a Kubernetes cluster that gate access to like what resources based on policies that you write. Um, these are all gating though internal resources at your business. Whether they're people or software infrastructure, they're all still kind of like the same structure. Um, it's not changing much, it's not customer facing. So on the flip side, um, I have once again SpiceDB, which is my, uh, my company's product. This is a database, so by definition it's malleable and you can model out uh, your own schema. So fundamentally that can be used for both IAM, but it actually shines most in CIM environments. And then as I was saying earlier, we have the library ecosystem where you get to actually build the structure, the data model that you want to see when you're using something like a Ruby library or a Python library in your web application. All right, so now we've done who. The next question I'm going to pose is where is the decision being made? Um, this kind of falls into two different camps of federated or centralized. Um, in federated systems, it means that you're actually um, reaching out into a couple different systems to be able to get the data you need to be able to make a decision. Um, and then on a centralized one, it means all the data is already in one place, all the computation can take place in that one place. Um, and there's a lot of different trade-offs here, um, and you may be forced to deal with a lot of different systems. So uh, oftentimes your domain totally drives um, which one you need here, uh, w way more so than um, kind of like your choice. So the major trade-off here, like I said uh, before, uh, we're mentioning consistency again, is consistency. If you are collecting data from a whole bunch of different sources, they're all gonna have different consistency models. You're gonna be working with what data consistency you can manage then once you've pulled all that into your system. So you're kind of just at the whim of the selection of systems that you are reaching into um, versus centralized, where all the data is in one place, you know about it at the uh, specific point in time in which you're querying that data, um, and you can have very strict uh, data consistency, or as I said earlier, like the bounded consistency where you can say um, as least as fresh as this particular point in time. Um, I will be pretty candid here. Federated systems are way easier for you to adopt. You're trading off consistency, but the data is already in a bunch of different systems. All you have to do is get it. Um, in a centralized system, you have to load data into a particular place ahead of time. You have to know that for my centralized system, I need to save data there at the point in time the data is created. That means implementing a lot of different integrations with a lot of different software potentially. Um, but the trade-off is you get this consistency. So if this consistency is a requirement to you, you're probably going to want a centralized system. Um, once again, open policy agent is the prime example I'm going to use for federated. Um, the kind of classic original deployment of open policy agent was to run along as a sidecar. So you would have your main process and then you'd have open policy agent running next to it. And what uh, a lot of folks would end up doing is having an interval where the data stored inside of open policy agent is refreshed. Um, so that data fundamentally is at the whim of how often you're refreshing um, your consistency is how often that is actually refreshing. Um, if uh, there's a change to some a system over, over here, you won't be able to see that change until that, um, that refresh interval comes back up and you resynchronize all the data inside of um, each open policy agent. So um, then on the centralized side, uh, SpiceDB is a database. When you use um, libraries building a web app like Rails or, or Django or Flask, um, you are going to be storing stuff in your database, like probably Postgres, um, alongside all the other models for all the other uh, um, objects that you're dealing with in your web application. So fundamentally, databases are centralized. That's kind of the point of a database. Um, so now we get to the final, uh, the final question we're going to ask, which is how. 
should the data, um, or how should the decision, the authorization decision, be made? Um, this one, I will warn you, is kind of getting into the weeds, and you should only kind of explore the how once you've kind of understood your problem a little bit better and you know kind of like the stumbling points. Um, for example, if you've uh, been using kind of like a role-based system in one of your applications, you have RBAC, and you realize you need some of these fine-grained things and you don't really know how you're going to add it, or maybe you uh, know that like you you have a feature requirement, you just had to make a whole bunch of changes to code, um, you're going to go through a security audit, you know that like you really need flexibility to be able to change these things um, more dynamically without this like crazy iteration loop that takes really long. Um, and you kind of like realized, all right, I need to get in the weeds. How? How do these things work so I can make sure that my problems in the future or the problems I'm currently facing, like I really deeply understand and make sure I'm doing the right thing for me. Um, so like I said, this should probably be your, your kind of last resort um, because it, it's going to go kind of like into the implementation details of the systems that you're using. Um, so this is not an apples to apples comparison, but these are two popular kind of concepts for implementing general purpose authorization systems. There are policy engines and then there's relational based access control. Um, Reback is not to be confused with RBAC. So just to, as a reminder, we're going a layer down. These are kind of ideas that you use to implement authorization systems. So, or, so you can use policy engines to implement RBAC. You can use relation-based access control to implement RBAC. Um, so we're like at the implementation layer and not at the kind of like consumer layer. Um, but uh, as I said earlier, these things are very, very different. They're kind of actually hard to compare, which uh, I am kind of like trying not to compare them, but saying that these are two different things you could choose from depending on um, kind of like what problem space you're working in. Um, so for policy engines, the kind of philosophy, the guiding philosophy for the design of these systems is that policy, which um, is the thing that decides whether you have access or not, is a computer program. Um, it's super familiar for programmers uh, because naturally um, you're going to think about writing code to solve these problems. Um, and then on the flip side, you have these reback systems, and they claim that the best way to represent um, basically permissions are the existence of relationships between data. So fundamentally, one is basically compute this program, you give it input, the output says yes or no. On the other side, you query a system that knows all these relationships, and it says whether or not it has found um, a sequence of relationships, a connection between all these, these things that says whether someone has access. So uh, the implications on, these, uh, on your system from adopting one of these, um, policy engines, kind of when I described this OPA kind of um, canonical deployment, um, OPA is a policy engine, um, it is federated. Uh, fundamentally, the input going into a policy engine has to come from somewhere, it, uh, um, and it's not kind of like the primary place where things typically live. So with a computer program, you're going to load input in. That, that point at which you're loading input, it's coming from various systems. So almost always, you're going to have a federated system. Um, and then on the relationship-based relationship side, um, you are almost always going to have a centralized system. Typically, they're a database um, or some other system because it's fundamentally data-driven. The data has to be in one place for it to function um, and kind of traverse the graph that gives you whether or not someone has access. Um, if you've taken a college CS class uh, or a college CS uh, program, you may have arrived at uh, a course where you go over kind of these two logic programming languages called Prolog and Datalog. Um, I think these are really great examples of uh, policy engines because you effectively insert um, a bunch of different facts into it and then you, um, it is basically a special purpose programming language for computing um, like deductions from that data. So it will tell you like yes or no. Um, so that is, is actually where a lot of research for authorization systems comes in. And if you're kind of looking at the space, sometimes you'll look at functionality that's kind of proven or implemented in a language like Datalog. Um, then I are, I've talked at length about Open Policy Agent, um, but actually the, the item below it is the more interesting one. Um, 
That is uh, Gandalf, which is a system at Netflix, which is actually the inspiration for Open Policy Agent. So it is kind of like the system internally there um, that inspired the open source release. And um, the reason why I bring this up and bring up kind of the other internal examples on the other side of things is to kind of demonstrate that it doesn't matter necessarily which solution you choose. They both scale. They scale differently, but there are mega companies out there using these systems at scale regardless of which one you choose. So don't think that like you're kind of sacrificing something by going with one or the other. Um, both large and small, people are using both systems inspired by these concepts. Um, so on the relationship-based side, we have SpiceDB. I've mentioned that at length, but SpiceDB is actually um, inspired by the system at Google called Zanzibar. And Zanzibar is basically a graph database built on top of Spanner, um, which is kind of their global scale SQL solution. Um, and uh, then I kind of wanted to bring in this last one, Knowledge Graph, uh, which is at Meta, previously Facebook, right? Um, and I kind of wanted to bring this up because the domain that you're working in can very much so inform which of these hows you pick. Um, Facebook itself, it's all a knowledge graph. So people have friends, they have friends of friends. This is how you think about data in Facebook. And when you ask, well, who can see my photos on Facebook? The question is always, well, my friends or my friends of friends. You're talking fundamentally about relationships between people and data. So if you find yourself when you're asking yourself who should have access to a particular thing, you keep, you keep seeing that it's like all relationship-based or maybe fundamentally your data model is re already relationship-based, you probably want to pick the solution that maps best to that. So with that, I've got some parting thoughts. There's absolutely no silver bullet for any of this. You really have to dig into your particular use cases. There's just so much here and so many levels like deep you can kind of go um, that if someone ever tells you, hey, you should just use this particular system, you should really question it, um, really di uh, like dive deep and make sure that that's actually the best solution for your use case. Um, terminology in this space, it can be super misleading. Um, people overload terms. Um, because so many gen uh, there are so many specialized solutions, um, going back to like the Claire example, um, you might see marketing material or even documentation that's using authorization terms um, or authentication terms in super confusing ways just because they're using it from the context of that specialization and not kind of like in the broader ecosystem. So I ask you to like approach these conversations about authorization tools with somewhat humility um, to be able to kind of step back and um, kind of confirm that when people are using particular terms, you're understanding what they're meaning. Um, and then, yeah, not everything's apples to apples. The last comparison I made it's really not fair to even compare them. They're completely different philosophies. They're driving to solve completely different problems, but you still need to evaluate them in terms of how they're going to solve your use case. Um, and with that, you should always ask questions and always let your use case drive you. No one else knows better than you. You shouldn't defer to any type of authority figure or anything. Think about what you're trying to accomplish and ask these questions of the tools you're, you're interested in using and that should be your guiding factor for picking what software or technology you're going to adopt, regardless of whether you're talking about authorization tools or anything else. With that, thanks.